All right. So let's do a few notes. Let me tell you really quick. I my plan is to have a quiz on 916 and 933 on Monday. If I am not here, there will not be a quiz. The quiz will be on Tuesday. I'll try to put on teams, but I won't know until Sunday morning. Next. So if I'm gone, we're going to watch a 25 minute video clip on the triangle shirtwaist line and about the need for, or this was an argument for regulation of business. And then the rest of the period, I'm going to give you a packet, the sub will give you a packet, on it's a book called The Jungle. And it's Jungle, and it's about, it was supposed to be about, about um, how difficult life was for new immigrants to the United States. But they focused the book on the hell of working in a slaughterhouse. And in it, they described the way food was produced. And this would radically change the United States, the jungle. So I have that and a few other examples about the way food is produced. There'll be some questions you have to do. So that's what we'll do on Monday. If I'm gone. If I'm here, we'll finish up this and then we'll have to do that the next day. Sound good? Is everyone happy? Speaking of that, I want to have a green slip. So as soon as we get up, we'll go upstairs. All right, if it's not signed, there's a place for you to do the wall sits that whole time where everyone else is getting registered. We have a few people gone. We have 30 students in the other class, and so this one's a little bit smaller. Do we get to the recross? Do we get to Cuba Libre? Yeah. The, the slides were just on the last thing that we did. Was this? No, the slide was the letter down. Oh, so we got the yeah. yeah, so we got the reconcentration camps and how awful I mentioned and what's gonna come out of the reconcentration camps. Well, anybody caught outside the camp was therefore a gorilla. And they would be tortured to death, if not killed immediately. And they would do these public executions of them. And the preferred method that Spain would do executions is an ancient one. Slow strangulation called garroting or gar garrot. They would be garroted. So this is a garrot chair, and it was made with this crank. See this? They would strap this leather around them and slowly turn this crank, this crank, so that will push their neck out into the leather strap, and they can make this strangulation last two days. Slow strangulation is an ancient torture you can do. You can do with anything, a rope, and slowly do it. But this one a special chair. Now these two pictures are being garroted. This is done for the camera. He's not really being garroted here either. But it shows this horrible torture, basically telling anybody, if you're caught as a gorilla and outside this camp, you will be tortured to death. Tear and push um, Cuba Libre to the hills. If you ever see a movie, like a movie, there's commandos or spies, and they have that piece of rope, and they come up behind somebody and strangle them. Have you ever seen a movie like that? No? Where they have a piece of rope, and they come behind, and this won't hurt. And they strangle them like that? That's called garrote. Oh, the flamingo's fading. Your support did not keep them alive, alit. That's on you. Anybody outside, the, or, but inside the camp, could you imagine what these conditions were like? The Spanish were negligent, they were ill-prepared, they were completely incompetent, and inside would be starvation. They never had enough food, the conditions were horrible, disease ran rampant through it, the big killers of, of yellow fever, especially yellow fever and malaria, but also dysentery, uh, cholera. The short-term effects, though, oh, I'll explain these pictures in just a second. Short-term effects were affecting for the Spanish. Cuba Libre had to hit to the hills. And in the short run, by 1897, Spain was getting, maybe not the upper hand, but gaining the initiative. The problem is this kind of policy cannot work because of what they're doing to the Cuban population. This is torture to the peasants. You can see some of the photos that were snuck out of these big concentration camps to the distended stomach of, from starvation. It was hell on earth in these camps. And many of these pictures would make it back to the United States in newspapers. But this is not an effective policy to stop the guerrillas. It's only going, it's going to create more guerrillas down the road. In the same year, or actually the next year, 
in South Africa. Dutch colonists to South Africa years ago called the Boers. They were in top, you know, the British were trying to take over all of South Africa from these Dutch colonists. And the Dutch colonists finally resisted the British in this pretty called Second Boer War, a bloody, horrible kind of guerrilla war. And Britain brought the same policy to South Africa. They used these camps to isolate Boer civilians and run down their, their guerrillas, they called the, the Boers called commandos. But the British shortened the name of these camps. The British called the camps concentration camps. And that's where the term comes from. Obviously, from this, by World War I, concentration camp just simply meant a camp. It, it had no connotation except for a large camp. When the United States started to rapidly increase the size of their army because of World War I, they called their basic training camps concentration camps. I know that sounds very weird today, but then what the Soviet Union's going to do? And then also the Japanese, but especially what Germany is going to do. The, the names are getting different connotation. The US would try the same thing in South Vietnam called strategic hamlets. So one other thing about this, these, remember that? Same awful results. See these photos? These are sensational. And these are the kind of things that when people are looking at papers, like, oh, I gotta see what happened. This kind of sensationalist journalism sells papers. Bloody, horrible scenes, pushing for some kind of reaction, yanking on people's most base instincts. And newspapers were in constant competition at this time. There were 100 daily newspapers in New York City alone. There were three dailies in Helena. There was so much more news back then than today. It's kind of mind boggling. As I've said before, we have access to all kinds of stuff with my phone, on your phone. But it's only a few reporters and there's almost no local news anymore. It's a real problem today. Then there's all kinds of news. And what gets people to buy stuff? Sensational stories like this that they can exaggerate. And you don't need to exaggerate much. This kind of journalism is going to be called yellow journalism. Sensationalism in, in, new, in news. And the two biggest purveyors of this were Joseph Pulitzer, the name you might have heard before, and William Randolph Hearst. The New York World Pulitzer's newspaper was, was an older, very established newspaper, probably the biggest in New York City. Hearst earned it, got, uh, was a very young man, got his money the old fashioned way, and bought the failing New York Journal and turn it into a direct competitor, the second biggest newspaper. And soon Hearst, um, his empire is still one of the biggest news and media empires in the world. What's the old fashioned way of making money? Inherited. He inherited it. So he got rich because after his parents died, he hardly knew. And Hearst started putting all these sensational stories. And therefore Pulitzer running was going, oh, I got to match the competition does these same kind of sensational stories. So any kind of murder, any kind of thing that they could pull attention, especially anything like this woman jumping from the Brooklyn Bridge, that was front page news. In 1895, there was a body they found, just a torso floating in Hudson Bay, floating in New York Harbor. It was nothing but literally, it was a woman's body, the arms and legs and head had been cut off. And they found this body and it became the biggest story of the year. The Herald and Hearst put out a reward for news on the death. They, they investigated themselves. Journalists went over and they actually helped solve this horrible murder. But that was the kind of thing that sold newspapers. Bloody stories, exciting stories. And soon everybody got involved in this. Yes, so that's yellow journalism, sensationalism in news. Yes. Same culture. Yeah, so Pulitzer, Kind of like you get these, you know, the big robber barons who build the college. He would leave an endowment of his fortune after he passed away for an award for excellence in journalism. Because he's kind of embarrassed and trying to cover this up. Well, nothing sells newspapers more than the war and the run up to war. And the pushing for war is called jingoism. War sells. Just as soon it would start selling it would sell newspapers in the run for World War One, World War II. You'd really see it. Got like 1990 when Iraq invaded Kuwait and the push and the excitement to go to war 
We saw this in 2003 and see it through today. A war sells papers and then television shows, just exciting, bloody stories. So they started pushing these stories about Cuban repression, repression and the United States should do something about it. Everyone got that? The U.S. should. So here is the Cuban mother here. And you notice, OK, that's supposed to be a starving baby. I know it looks like an old man, but it's supposed to be a, a child. That's the reconcentration camp. You see the vulture in the background. And started putting all these sensational stories saying the United States should do something and drumming up an appeal to go to war. In 1897, the famous Western artist, Frederick Remington, tried to earn a little money. He would do sketches for Pulitzer. Pulitzer sent him down to Havana. Now, his, some of his paintings are at the historical society. They're like dramatic shots of cavalry charges. Well, Remington wired back by telegraph to Pulitzer saying there's nothing going on. Cuba Libre is in the hill, Savannah's quiet. And Pulitzer responded with, you supply the pictures, I'll supply the war. Just give me stuff. And so Remnant started making up stuff like this. So a steamer is a, a, is a um, small passenger line. And it says, Spaniards strip or search women on American steamers, implying strip searching. So you see, these men around, leering at her. Do you remember that picture I showed, so, showed you on Wednesday? A fisk in the hierarchy of race of those four faces and in the middle, that white, very bright Caucasian. Isn't that almost the same picture? These three or four men leering. You look at this face, strip searching her and find something more horrible is happening. This is really social Darwinism. But it's really sensationalizing this. Was that happening? Not at all. Nothing like that was happening. Remington heard a story. Hey, I heard they might do searches. So he made it, made up a story and pulled it around with it like this. What's that? Look what those evil Spanish are doing. Not just refreshing, repressing Cuban natives, but look what else. Yellow journalism sells papers. Today, and this is the way it's been since the, the beginning of television for local TV news, which is still one of the biggest things that local television stations show, their slogan is, if it bleeds, it leads. Meaning any murders, any bad accidents, any shooting, that's front. They show that. That's part of the reason why people think crime is, go, uh, is still going up. Last year was the biggest drop in percentage of murder rates in American history was last year, in American history. And we're still so much lower than the 90s in murder rates, even at the height of 2020 when we had a little blip. And yet the stories about murders actually went up in 2020. Why? Leads it leads. They get people to watch. Where did the term yellow journalism come from? Saturday, Sunday morning, it became a thing to sell papers. They would put comics in papers to try to get parents to buy for their kids. And also adults to read the comics too. Papers are dying, which is really sad, but where are people are gonna get their news? Meaning more people not knowing what's going on. But they, the, the Herald started putting color in their Sunday comics. And the most popular cartoon was called Hogan's Alley. And Hogan's Alley's most popular character was the yellow kid. And that became a sensation to sell papers. So sensationalism to sell papers. Yellow kid was the first really big thing. Yellow journalism. And it says the crowd gets up an election bonfire and the yellow kid plays Nero. So some of you might know Nero was the Roman emperor who played the lira, or which is kind of like a fiddle. So fiddled while Rome burnt. It's in what, 62 CE. But this is all about New York politics. And I don't need to explain it. You guys understand, you guys understand 1890s New York politics, don't you? It's pretty easy to follow. I can just put this on a test and you can interpret this really well. I mean, there's there's kids, we got a horn, a hot foot, hot pants, hot pocket. You put a rag in someone's pocket and light it on fire. Hot pants, get it? Okay, there's goat, parakeet. I have no idea what's going on. 
no idea at all. Thank you. That goat up liberty. Could be. I don't know though. Can you trust all goats? So here's the yellow kid, but now it's Hearst and Pulitzer as the yellow kid pushing for war. And like they're pushing against each other, but they're pushing so hard it's going to lead to war. So going in 1898, more and more people are demanding McKinley to do something about Cuba. This is uh, then basically saying, first, this is my war, both are pushing back. And this will go on to this day. OK, unfortunately, the Weekly World News is no longer sold, at, uh, but they still have like the National Enquirer. These are those little magazines that you go like at a grocery store with the, the point of purchase ones. They try to sell right before you check out. But the Weekly News, and they had this whole running thing about Bat Boy. <laughs> That boy. That's kind of exaggerating uh, news. And then stuff about former President Bill Clinton. It was pretty funny. That's exaggerated sensationalism. But what about Cuba? The U.S. policy was basically to remain neutral. But more and more, McKinley felt pushed to make Spain do something, maybe even leave. But U.S. policy, let's be clear about it. And this sums it up really well. Maybe Spain leave, but what will be left? This would be a newspaper editorial cartoon, but then would be painted and sold as a print that people have. And it's really good because it's implying it's in Spanish misrule, and then it says Cuba. And then that's Cuba aflame with anarchy, and it says the duty of the hour. That's the duty for the United States. The duty of the hour to save her, not from Spain, but from a worse fate. Not from Spain, not just from Spain, but a worse fate. So, two things. First off, if you notice her face, if you remember that picture I showed you on Wednesday, Teddy Roosevelt carrying the Cuban up the hill, remember what that face looked like, how they drew that horrible caricature? Remember Queen Lulu Kalani's horrible face? That's not the same face, is it? It's darker skin, and they want you to know that is not light skin. I mean, there's so much color of skin dividing people up. But it's not the same face, is it? It's not the same. They want you to not look down. They want you to be sympathetic. And one more thing. Is that to save Cuba to allow them to be free? What happens if Spanish rule goes away? If Spain is gone, what happens to Cuba? Who's Spain is cooking them on the anarchy, but who's creating or who would create the anarchy? Who? Spain are just cooking them. The Cubans. The Cubans can't govern themselves. Spain is making it worse, but Cuba can't govern themselves. It's not saying the U.S. policy, this sums it up, is not saying Cuba being independent. It's saying who should run Cuba? It's the duty of the hour, U.S.'s duty. What's the policy? The United States should do what? Take over. Everyone got that? Isn't that a clever cartoon? By the way, what philosophy is that? This is all social dogmas. They can't govern themselves. We will do our white man's burden. This is intensely prejudiced but it's social Darwinism. So, back to Bat Boy. Going in 1898, the Delome letter was sent. Dupuy Delome was the Spanish ambassador of the United States. He's in Washington, D.C. And he's watching American politics get more and more jingoistic. Jingoistic means pro-war. And he sends a telegram back to Madrid. Now, this was a secret telegram. He was just writing it back to Madrid. So. He's sending it back to the foreign minister, basically just saying his vision of American politics. And so just write down, he criticized McKinley, but then the italicized part, read. What is he saying? You see it back here? Oh, yeah, you guys have done this. Hmm? 
So I mean, what is Big Hitler? If he, huh? Yeah, coward, or what's another word for it said? The spineless. He's coward. You can tell him what to do. He'll do whatever the crowd pushes him. They want more to be pushed. And potentially it's for money too. It's really criticizing McKinley. Now, he never meant this for people to get up to see it. This was a private telegram, but he had to send it through the Western Union Station, which is a private company that was the biggest telegraph station. And they were part of the consortium that had a transcontinental telegraph line that connected New York City to London, and then London spread throughout Europe. First had somebody he bribed working at a telegraph station, stole the telegraph, and printed the paper. It was never meant to be printed. And so it's going to come out that the U.S. or the Spanish ambassador is calling the president of the United States weak, spineless, greedy. Therefore, by implication, he's saying who is weak, spineless, and greedy? The United States. He's adapting the United States. Now, remember those pictures I showed you of McKinley, like he was in the pocket of Hannah? and how they drew McKinley's face. A lot of Americans thought McKinley was just that. His own undersecretary of the Navy, Teddy Roosevelt, said that McKinley did not have the backbone of a chocolate eclair, which is a delicious pastry. But here's the point. We can make fun of him. You can't make fun of him. He's our idiot. He's not your idiot. And so now, Americans are saying McKinley's got to do something. And now, what does McKinley have to do? He's got to act like he's not a wimp, that he's not spineless. He's got to act strong. How do you act strong? I don't know. Well, default mode. I'll show that I have ships. He sent the obsol obsolescent, so a near obsolete ship called the USS Maine. It did have steel armor, it had some modern guns, but it was already too slow, too old for modern combat. So he's in an old battleship basically as a show of he's top, I'll set the Navy. But you notice it's always somebody else who's gonna go actually put themselves in harm's way. And it was meant to intimidate the Spanish but not go too far. He's trying to show top, because he still doesn't know what he wants to do. Let me rephrase that. Hannah doesn't know what he's gonna tell McKinley what to do. And what happened to the main? The main exploded on February 17, 1898. Sitting there at night, the main exploded, took almost 260 people down with them. This old battleship blew up. To this day, we're not 100% sure what happened, but almost immediately, you can imagine what they're going to say. Here's a Hearst Journal. Who destroyed the main? Destruction of the warship main was the work of an enemy. It was blown up. They're going to put a $50,000 award. That was his old trick to do for murderers. They would do the same thing. It was not an accident. And then look at the picture. By the way, naval officers think the main was destroyed by a Spanish mine. You see it? Right there. A mine exploded up. An underwater mine in the Civil War, they called them torpedoes. Exploded, blowing up the main. Spain blew up a ship. Here... The, the world said, oh, we're going to actually show up being blown up. Not just being blown up. Can you see it? There's actually flaming bodies flying from that picture right there. Spain blew it up. A bomber torpedo. No doubt about it. Spain attacked us. And now what can McKinley do? And so you can imagine how cartoons will be like posters like this. Murdered by, um, by the Spanish. Look at the horrible caricature of this brute. Look at the bodies behind. Soon all Americans are demanding revenge. Remember the main and the hell with Spain. That was after the, the war would end. They would eventually drag it out a little bit. In the 70s, they drug it way out. This mass is right now, it's in Arlington National Cemetery. And I guess this is a really popular place for people to scuba dive outside of the Havana. I guess you scuba dive in the wreckage of the main. Fuck, the main blew up. What blew up the main? What? 
Probably not shoddy, but old. Here's the deal. Spain did not do it. Because that would be insane. Spain would be, would be starting a war. Let's look at a map. I don't know if you guys know this, but Spain is here. There's something called an ocean between them and Cuba, and the United States is 90 miles away. And Spain is a weak, decrepit country in free fall decline. And the United States is a growing, dynamic country. Doesn't have a huge military, but it's the largest industrial country in the world. Ask Britain. No way Spain did it. So it was probably a problem in their in their steam in the furnace for the steam engine. And there's probably sparks. And if you know anything about like coal dust in a combined area, if there's anything, it's really flammable. Grain silos do that. You know? Yes. Hmm? Sugar does that. Grain, sugar does that. Grain does. Just the dust will explode. From what? Oh. I remember doing that in my in the science class. We blew up. Uh, but it was certainly an accident. It was certainly an accident. We're not 100% sure because we're, we can't be 100% sure. It's it been so degraded. We're like 99% sure. Well, now what? Well, first, Hannah was like, no, we don't want war. Oh, that's the procession bringing the body back to New York. And this funeral was huge. And then just, just drum beat, get Spain. Yeah. How is it that we have like good relations with these countries now? Like we fought them so much. Well, I mean, we have we fought Britain a number of times. We fought a couple really big wars with this place called Germany. And we got good relations. We were ally with Russia in two wars and then well, and the Soviet Union and had bad relations. So things change. There's a lot of money involved too, yeah. But here, remember the Spain, and don't forget the starving Cubans. So bringing back the reconcentration camps, which had basically closed by 1898. So Hannah was reluctant. And then, after a meeting with J.P. Morgan and others, they said, you know, maybe war would be good for us, AKA business. If we get an empire, that means the U.S. is going to have to build up a military. And where are they going to buy the steel for their ships? U.S. steel. They're going to buy from us. They're going to need food, uniforms, equipment. Boy, you should have seen the drum beat by corporations for the war in Iraq and Afghanistan in your lifetime. They made boatloads of money. Regardless, I mean, they make money in every war. So, finally, reluctantly, when Hannah said, you know, I guess we want more. Then McKinley's like, we must go to war. And therefore, he asked Congress, and Congress declared war. Now, the army's tiny, so they immediately got to spread to all the states, and they demanded that they basically put a quota out. You must put out this many troops. We need this many troops now. And that meant the National Guard, everything. And thousands of volunteers. They did not not have to draft. Volunteers came. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 That involved and volunteers. It was shocking how many volunteers came. It was like, oh yes, we don't want to miss the fun and go to war. Yeah. Civil war. And then we'll hold later. And we'll talk about that. That was shockingly controversial World War I. Theodore Roosevelt, the Undersecretary of the Navy, was desperate for this war. His father was hired a substitute during during the Civil War, and he wanted to prove his bravery. He was kind of a sickly child. And so spent the rest of his life trying to prove he was athletic and fit, which he was. But he was desperate for war, intensely social Darwinist. Interesting man. So he's going to leave this position almost immediately and volunteer to fight. But his last major move is he would order the U.S. fleet, which the U.S. Navy is fairly good size, for the first part of this war, the first U.S. naval action, he sent U.S. ships to attack Spanish forces where? It's all about Cuba, right? Makes sense. Cuba, right? Cuba? Of course, it's Cuba, right? It's not got to be Cuba. It's the Philippines. The Philippines was a Spanish colony. The Philippines 
was much bigger than Cuba, a massive population, a thousand islands in this archipelago, and it's really close to the lucrative China trade. The U.S. had ships in the British colony of Hong Kong. We had, and they, we beefed up to 17 modern ships, and they sailed to attack Havana Harbor. So if there's any doubt what this war is about, it's to protect Cuban civilians. No, this was a war of conquest without a doubt. And do you remember the Mexican-American War, where the US soldiers were killed on what side of the river? It wasn't clear, but Polk said it was on the, on the northern side of the Rio Grande. Went to war, wasn't quite true. Now the same thing is happening. Same exactly. Will it happen again? Of course. So here's the Philippines. Last couple things for today. Admiral Thomas Dewey, or Commodore Thomas Dewey, 17 modern ships. The Spanish had 17 ships there, but they were old. A few of them still had iron armor, and iron is not near as strong as steel. And so this was a total mismatch. Took them a few days to steam down there, and then they attacked the Spanish fleet. And I want a picture of Dewey on his flagship, the Hartford. So you want to see Dewey on the Hartford? Here's Dewey on the Hartford, and he led from the front. Okay, I typed in Thomas Dewey, and I was looking for a certain picture, and Mickey Rat came up. So I decided I had to show you Mickey, Mickey Rat. Huh? Yeah, well, this is Mickey Rat. <laughs> and so the Battle of Manila Bay would be a huge American victory. The Spanish fleet was devastated, but the new weapons, like the Hartford, his flagship had eight inch guns. Those eight inch guns could fire 12 miles accurately. The problem is they never really trained to fire that far. They were still fighting like they were ships of the line and it was the Battle of Trafalgar in 1806. 99% of the shells missed. They weren't ready for this new weapons at all. But the Spanish fleet was taken, and the Filipinos, who were also fighting their own war for independence, thought that the Americans were there. If I were overjoyed, the Americans had come to liberate us, and we're going to become an independent country. What are the Philippines, Filipinos going, going to find out when the first American troops arrive three months later? Like that? Yeah, we're going to conquer it. And that will begin a horrible war, but not quite yet. And that is a good place to. No, let's get one more thing. I lied. Just deal with it. The Teller Amendment. The Teller Amendment was an amendment to the Declaration of War. And we wanted to act like we were not fighting for conquest. So Cuba will be independent. It's not a war of conquest. But you notice I put a question mark there. Define independent. Hmm. And what about the Philippines or Guam or Puerto Rico? All right, grab your green slip. Oh, one more thing. Remember the faces? There's Cuba being defended by the United States. You, just on your web, notice the face? How they draw Cuba? It's not the same face as Lily Lucalani. That's really important. I'll finish this up on Monday or Tuesday. Grab your stuff. Um, now, everyone grab your stuff. You, you, I'll, I'll, I'll just. Uh, excuse yeah, you from there, sound good? <laughs> Stay in the basement, please be polite. There are other classes going on, so. Stay in the basement, so go and make a ride down the basement, go up to the library, go ahead and take off. Please be quiet in there, grab your stuff. Okay, same church. <laughs> Tell me, Council. Everyone got the stock? If you don't have the stock, we just got to go upstairs. You have to go off it. You should watch. Assassination. I mean, I'll be right after I just talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, go and grab a substance.
Now you said that, that diagram would take you 10 minutes, or a minute. Yeah. Oh, you gave me the word list, and I'm like, yeah. yeah that I wanted <laughs> everyone to do well. Just get the basic. All right, I'll, I'll see you in a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Alright, finish that. I got it. Guess we're all done. Okay, got that.